Hey guys, good morning, good afternoon and good evening. Uh, welcome again to another episode with Coffee with Mirko. And uh, today it's another amazing uh, chance to learn more about coffee and meet people, uh, professionals across the industry that you always looked up to. So as usual, we're gonna start with a quick uh, brew. Uh, today the brew is gonna be nice and quick because I don't wanna uh, take up too much of time and uh, uh, wet the paper now. Oh, Scott is already here, so the surprise is over. Um, hey, Philip. So yeah, for everyone tuning in, uh, you're in for a treat. So once we finish off this quick error press, uh, we will be joined by uh, writer, roaster, scientist, um, influencer, uh, coffee man, uh, Scott Rao. So I'm very excited and uh, you guys will be able to ask questions, of course. Um, I already have a few uh, offline questions and we'll, uh, yeah, we'll just get the ball rolling. So without further ado, we're just gonna quickly make a cup of coffee. Feeling a little bit pressure, Scott watching, but it's okay. So yeah, uh, today is episode 22, and uh, I've just been super happy to have been joined by so many coffee professionals in the uh, in the past few weeks. It's been just overwhelmingly uh, a lot of grateful, a lot of gratitude towards uh, all the people that have joined us so far, and good to see all of you guys back and forth. Uh, Daniel, Cafejana, Sarouche, and all of you guys. So it's actually good to see you all coming back here. Obviously, it means a lot to me and it means a lot to the people who join us as guests, of course, to see you all. So yeah, if you're not familiar with uh, Scott Rao, well, you should definitely Google it and read one of his amazing books. And uh, yeah, after this hour, hopefully you'll be able to get more of an insight around coffee, roasting, and recipes, anything that you like to ask, uh, always happy to answer questions. Danny Andrade is in the house. Hey, Danny. Hatana, Croatia, Ferdi, good to see you all. I'm just gonna pin down here today's guest, talking with Scott. Around. Here we go. So it's good to pin this down the bottom. And uh, yeah, I don't wanna wait too long, uh, just cause I wanna get started. So I will plunge and uh, we'll, we'll see you very shortly. So get yourself a cup of coffee. It is coffee with me at good time after all. So I like this to be a big virtual communal table where we are joined by one of the most influential people in the coffee game uh, in the world and we'll just have a chat, sip a cup of coffee and uh, when you want to ask a question, I might be able to read them, but if I skip it, just send it through again. So, you know, we'll go with the flow. Flair Express in the house too. Hey, Andrew, good to see you. Daniel, uh, it's 9 a.m. in Australia, so that's the current time. Black Coffee Hunter, hey guys, good to see you all. Nadir, Mo, and everyone who's just joined. So. I will very quickly get my coffee and uh, let Scott through. Hey, Mirko. Nice to meet you. Hey, Scott. How are you? Good to meet you. Very good. Nice to see you. Uh, first things first, how's you and your family with the entire pandemic and everything? Everyone is good. Uh, we're we're fine. We're just drinking too much coffee. That's all. So, how about you? <laughs> that's, that's a great problem. I'm in the same. I'm in the same. Uh, I'm in the same boat. Actually, I just picked up a beautiful um, coffee from Peru by the guys from Rumble. Nice. So very surprised. Um, very very tasty. Washed from uh, Peru, and uh, yeah, I ran out of coffee yesterday, so that was what I picked. Um, <laughs> I know there's going to be a lot of questions from people, so I don't want to uh, talk too much about the weather. Glad that you're fine. 
Uh, thank you for joining us. It's an honor and pleasure to have you on. Thank um, you for having me. You, no, it's, it's, thank you for coming. Um, you're considered one of the most influential people of our industry, uh, but how did you actually get started in the coffee? How did you start your journey? Uh, when I was 22, I, I left university and I decided that I wanted to open a coffee house. So I ended up uh, driving all over America looking for like the safest location possible to put a coffee shop. And I ended up in a small university town of about 30,000 people. And it was a very, very busy little town and opened my first shop there. And uh, the shop did extremely well and uh, I was roasting and having that shop for about seven years. And then uh, after that, I sold the place and then ended, ended up opening another couple of uh, roastery cafes over time. So basically, after setting up a few, you know, successful businesses, you sold them, moved on. Was that because your core passion was calling you? And what is that core passion? Is that, you know, teaching, experimenting? I mean, I, I, I think I love problem solving. And I loved owning a cafe. But even when I owned the cafe, I would, I would work an entire day open to close. I'd be exhausted and I would stay behind in order to do experiments and, and try to figure out something new. So I don't care if it's coffee or something else. I want to solve problems all the time. Which, you know, the, the word consultant, then it becomes, uh, you know, a perfect title to go ahead with, you know, uh, hand in hand with problem solving, which is great. And, uh, and did you always like writing as well? Because obviously you wrote a no, few books. You know, as a kid, I used to avoid writing assignments like the plague. I just, I, I hated writing. And... Um, but, you know, I've always thought that if you if you know your subject, that writing is a lot easier. And I felt like I felt like I knew what I wanted to say in my first book. And the writing was a lot easier than I thought it would be. So now I feel now I feel comfortable with writing, but it took a little while. Of course, of course. And um, I think I, what, what, what a lot of, you know, a lot of people get stuck with coffee. And, you know, coffee is a beautiful community made by lots of amazing people. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, from from bottom to top um do you have any like special word of wisdom uh for all the people out there who are chasing the you know the passion for coffee but they're stuck with a good job right right i mean i think i think the best thing you could do for yourself in coffee is work for a company or or any situation where you can surround yourself with talented people because you know especially in the early days you want to learn it isn't about, oh, you know, this company is going to pay me a dollar more than this company. It's about who can you learn from and, and what kind of good influences can you get? And then eventually you parlay all of those influences and experiences into something that's really great as a career. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I, think, I think following what you love is really one of my pillars of what I believe. I think, you know, there is no worse thing than doing something that you hate. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. and, and a lot of people find coffee because coffee called them in whereas they needed a job because uh you know they were starting a uni or whatnot and then ended up having amazing careers i mean there's plenty of examples out there of amazing professionals who reached uh, top top spots in the world and they just started coffee by chance so sure. i think if coffee is your passion definitely is uh, worth pursuing uh, now i know you travel all over and uh you know you see lots of different things uh, what I what we see in Australia, uh, a problem that we often see is that a lot of people with zero experience open cafes, mm. and that creates a lot of issues yep. um, within the market because they still whether it's five, six, ten kilos a week uh, of the guy who actually knows a thing or two about coffee, but also they put themselves in a dangerous situation. But yeah. They they also the victims because someone told them to diversify their portfolio and opening a cafe would be a great idea. Yeah. Um, what what do you think could be a solution around this, you know, problem? Well, uh, send them to me because every time I get clients like that, I tell them not to open a cafe. <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand it. I, I mean. You wouldn't, there are so many jobs you wouldn't do without experience. Almost all jobs, almost all jobs, you, you would think, oh, I need, I need school or I need experience or I need a mentor. And people just jump into coffee. They're like, no, I like coffee. That's good enough. I don't understand it at all. Um, you know, if you're, if you're competing with people like that, all you can do is just do the best you can. And 
eventually you'll win. It's just that um, these things are going to happen in, in capitalism, you know? Yeah, and I think what happens often, especially here in Melbourne, because we live in such a, you know, uh, you know coffee and brunch is just a culture here in Melbourne. And I, I just, you know, witness couples going out and on yeah. the weekend and they're like they're start counting patrons and they're like, oh my God, this mesh double count is $18.50 yeah. AUD, I mind you. And they're like, oh, I will do it better. I'll put alpha on top of yeah. the toast and you know, and then little they know the mechanism around this. So, I mean, uh, just to put it in perspective for the people watching, how difficult is to run, operate and grow an actual cafe? Oh, I mean, it was the hardest. The first, my first cafe was the hardest thing I ever did in my life. I was exhausted. I lost 15 kilos over the first year. Uh, I was thin to begin with, you know, and uh, I was so stressed. And, you know, you're, you're in debt and you're worried about customers and you've got staff issues and it's, it's nonstop drama, uh, difficulties. You know, I, I don't know why people romanticize it so much sometimes. Um, I mean, it is great when you come out the other end and you know what you're doing and, and it gets easier. But the first few years are hard. Um, you know, I want, I want to say something very strange is that <clears throat> when those people go to the, you know, when they go to St. Ali in South Melbourne on a Sunday and they see a thousand people, most people are at cafes when most people are there. In other words, if you go to a cafe once a week and you only go at Sunday brunch, your perception of the cafe's busyness is very different than if you go every day at three o'clock, right? Because most people are there when most people are there. So you know, non-cafe owners always overestimate how busy cafes are. They know they're Monday to Friday or Monday to Sunday. That's right. And at the quiet times where you're still paying two, three, four, five people, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, especially in a big shop like Sena Lee uh, in South Melbourne. So, yeah, 100%. Yeah. Um, and, and also, there's so much complications. I, I think that I can't say number one, but definitely top five issues for a cafe or dramas is around staff. Oh, yeah. Sick, training, leaving, uh, yep. fair work or whatever you have in the States, I think that staff is really one of those elements. So when people used to come to me when I was to, when I used to work at, at Toby's Estate uh, and they, you know, try to start talking to me, asking me, you know, taking me around to see shops, you know, to like, oh, would you think I like this or like that? Just pick the smallest. Uh, that was my number one thing. Like, if you don't know how to cook and you just, you know, you know how to make coffee, don't worry, a big ass kitchen, the smallest place, the less people you need, then from there, you can scale your brand and go, you know, you can go for the yeah. bigger shop. I think yeah. that yeah. that's another issue because sometimes there's some attractive shops out there with cheap rent and cheap rates and it's the huge. Yep. But is it worth it? You know? I don't know. In Australia, it's a tough market. So. 100%. Um, now, we actually had some uh, questions sent through offline, so I'm going to read some of them as we go through it. Uh, Giancarlo is this amazing guy from New Zealand. Uh, he asked, uh, do you think this, the starting temperature should be lower than the end temperature in most cases? Are we talking about roasting? Yeah, roasting, because the second question of his is about first crack, so yeah. Um, the starting temperature should be similar and probably slightly lower than the, than the end temperature, yes. Um, the way I see it is that the machine has what we call thermal energy. So imagine the, the temperature of the machine times the mass of the machine. And the thermal energy goes up and down in like a little sine wave while you roast all day long. Like you're at the end of a batch, it's high. You start a new batch, it's low. End of a batch, it's high. And it's just this all day long. And you want to be charging somewhere in the middle of that sine wave. So you want to be charging somewhere like this. Because if you're charging, say, down here, then the machine is going to have to soak up a lot of temperature from the gas is going to soak up a lot of heat from the gas uh, instead of giving that heat to the beans for the first few minutes of a roast. So you want to really stabilize the machine's thermal energy. And to do that, you want to be charging somewhere in the middle of that thermal energy range, which is usually slightly below the final temperature. Thanks for that. Makes sense. And while, while we're here, his second question was, does your first crack work well with Lauren or other machines other than a probat? Are they talking about the ETROR trick for first crack? Is that what he's talking about? Yeah. Um, it works for most machines. It doesn't work as well if a machine 
um, has so much thermal stability that the ETROR curve doesn't move much. So if the ETROR curve does this, it works really well. And if the ETROR curve just does this, it doesn't work so well. Gotcha. Cool. Thanks for that. I'm sure he's going to rewatch it because he had to attend to his sick daughter, so oh. he couldn't watch live. So that's that's cool. Um, you know, he's always been coming on the show, so it's a uh, all right. That's cool. That I can read them offline. Um, now, um, out of the out of the box question, what do you usually drink in the morning? <laughs> Just filter <laughs> coffee. I usually make like a Kalito or a Stag or a V60. Uh, I use the decent espresso machine to brew it. Um, but uh, I, I have always enjoyed filter coffee more than uh, espresso. No offense to the uh, the Australians. <laughs> oh, I, I at home I only got filter, so that that that's me um, for sure. Um, what I'm going to do is I'll try to catch some of the questions in the comments. There are yeah. already a lot, but uh, yeah. I'll try my best. The latest from Denny. Denny was actually uh, one of the guests here uh, a couple of days ago. Uh -huh. um, you mentioned yesterday that. Bean size, most share is more important than the site. Than the site, oh, I think there's a spelling, to plant a roast. How about processing methods? How important is processing methods to plant a roast? Uh, oh, okay. So what Danny's talking about is I mentioned that the amount of gas that you use is determined number one by bean size and number two by moisture content. Um, and he's correct. Number three is processing. So washed coffees might need a little bit more gas than naturals and honeys might be in between. Um, it's important. I mean, if I had to put percentages on it, I might be at like 50% for bean size and like 30% for um, moisture content and maybe 10% for processing and maybe 10% for everything else. Gotcha. Something like that. That makes sense. And then we got, uh, does espresso really die or it's the same as with filter coffee? To put the other way, what happens with espresso after it has cooled down from Phil? Uh, okay. So <clears throat> I'm not a chemist. I don't know everything going on in there. But uh, the primary acid in coffee is chlorogenic acid, right? And when chlorogenic acid goes down below about 85C or about 175 Fahrenheit, the chlorogenic acid degrades into quinic acid and caffeic acid. And those are sour and bitter. So you get more sour and bitter coffee as the coffee cools. So we've all had coffee that was sitting in a, in a press pot for two hours, and it's very sour and very bitter. And it's because all the chlorogenic acid has broken down into caffeic and quinic. So that's like one of the big things that happens when coffee uh, sits around for a while. Cool. Well, you talk about not being a chemist, but... Well, you, you, I think you know a lot of chemistry about coffee. Uh, remind me of the Breaking Bad of coffee, maybe. <laughs> in a good way. <laughs> um, in a good way, of course. I mean, it was always coming from a good way. Uh, yeah, such a good series. Um, and then we go, my name is Atlas. Uh, well, hopefully he has the book from James. Um, when roasting a new coffee for the first time, how do you approach the first roasting plan dash process okay so what i do is i keep a record of the beans that i've roasted in the past and i keep track of the bean size and the moisture content and the processing just like we just talked about and let's say i i have a new guatemalan coffee and i look back at my old records and i find that last year i had a panama that had the same bean size moisture content processing I would attempt to use the settings from last year's Panama for this year's Guatemala as a starting point. That sounds, yeah, fair. Now, um, you, you cover the whole spectrum of coffee, you know, roasting, barista, riding. So, you know, you, you kind of, which, which is great. Uh, could you pinpoint a couple of memorable moments throughout your journey within coffee since, you know, the very beginning? Memorable moments in terms of business, in terms of learning, in terms of what? Anything, something that stands out for you as a highlight and people are like, oh, okay, wow, well, okay. Mm. Even best coffee, which is, doesn't exist, but, you know, like a coffee that you're like, wow, I really, anything, a moment. Sure, sure. So when I was um, 22 years old and I had my first business in my first year, um, I went to George Howell's company, which was then called Coffee Connection. And I had this Kenya Kiranyaga that just blew my mind. It was just 
you know, blueberries and currants and, and it was beautiful and it was whiny and, you know, and I'd had a few great coffees like that from him in the past, but, but, you know, coffees like that burned into my memory and made me think like, I'm going to do that one day. I'm going to make that happen. You know? Yeah. Um, also, um, I had this, I had this consulting job once about maybe eight, nine years ago for a really big company. And when I got there, all the people who worked at the company were really resentful of the fact that I was there. Like the boss hired me, but they felt like I was there to, to, to tell them how to do their jobs and they didn't like it. And it's true. I mean, that, that was, you know, I was, I was hired to do that essentially. And so I felt very motivated to make sure that whatever I did was going to leave a big impact. And I spent the night after the first night, after the first day I was there, I spent the night pouring over their roasting data. And I'd never really done this to this degree before because roasting software was still in its infancy. And maybe this was 10 years ago. And um, I came up with a couple of ideas, for instance, like the smooth ROR. And I came back the next day and I implemented some of these ideas based on looking at all their data, looking at the batches that we liked, figuring out you know, what worked and what didn't, and just did this data crunching for like six hours, right? Came back, implemented some ideas, and everybody there was completely won over the next day. I remember the boss sat down, he had a cup of his Ethiopian, he took, he took a sip of it, he sat down, he didn't talk to anyone for like five minutes, he just stared at the cup of coffee. And then finally he spoke and he was like, you know, I never knew my coffee could taste like this. And that was, that was like, the best moment of my career at the time. Like it was the coolest thing that he totally appreciated it and, and saw that it was very different, you know? Yeah, that, 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 yeah, that, that would have been a great moment for sure. Thanks for sharing. I think it's good. I think it's good for people because um, sometimes we put things and people on a pedestal, but you know, we're all humans and we all, uh, you know, we, we, we all start somewhere, you know? So it's yeah, about, yeah. and hey, you know, we're, we're all wrong pretty much. Like everything I say, everything I say is probably wrong. It's probably less wrong than most people, but I, I'm always making mistakes and I'm always improving and fixing those mistakes. And hopefully everybody else is too, you know? Oh, look, everything, everything that, you know, we do, it's proven to be wrong by someone in the near future. The thing with you is that usually that person is you. <laughs> We're wrong. <laughs> so that's the only catch there. But yes, yeah, sure. Um, and while we stick here in the memory lane, um, what advice would you give to yourself when you first started in coffee? Oh man, I would just, I would just worry less. I worried so much about the staff, about the coffee, about everything. And I, and honestly, that's, that, that first shop was amazing, but I didn't enjoy it that much because I was too worried about it. And it's, it's sad. Like I look back and I think I could have, I could have really thoroughly enjoyed it rather than just constantly thinking like are we doing okay financially are people happy is the staff okay am i okay you know just and i, I kind of missed i missed out on part of it you know okay Th thanks for that i think uh, yeah we all have those uh words of advice for ourselves uh eventually once we get there um there's a lot of question coming through um Daniel, I'm planning to open my own roastery and I want to start small, six kilos, because of the budget. Or it's wiser to start with a bigger roaster. I already have a sample roaster. Thanks. So I think if you can afford a 12 kilo, go with a 12 kilo. Because you can put three kilos into a 12 kilo and get a very successful batch. So you can grow into it. Um, and, you know, you have a lot of options. Like if you have too much capacity, you could sell some time on your machine to somebody else. Or if you have a lot of capacity and somebody comes up to you and says, hey, I want to give you a 500 kilo a week account, you can say yes. Um, so if you can afford it, I think go with a bigger machine. I've never, ever known anyone who regretted buying a machine that was too big. I've known a lot of people who regretted buying a machine that was quickly too small. Yeah, that's, that's right on. And yeah, if I agree with you, especially when you start tapping in wholesale. You just never know, especially if you grow your brand. And I've seen it working in the wholesale business. Uh, sort of things with coffee as well and then you're like if you can't do it then you're leaving a lot of business on the table for sure yeah thanks um mohammed is asking uh why you think uh flick crash is technically true what was the impact of the taste exactly i was a bit not sure about this question what he means okay so i think he's asking about um what's the impact of the crash in the flick 
on flavor and and uh, okay the bracket threw me off yeah cool i'm yeah, glad you got it yeah so when the ror crashes we call this baked coffee and it makes the coffee less sweet and juicy and round it makes the coffee more hollow flat kind of like straw or cardboard um the flick is when the ror goes up at the end and the flick makes the coffee much more roasty so the combination of crash and flick is very bad because it gives you baked and roasty, which is very, very common. In fact, I think that before roasting software was around that everybody was crashing and flicking because they didn't know it was happening. And it's sort of a natural problem to have. So um, I'm not really sure that the rest of his question is a little confusing. So that's probably all I'll say about that. That's, that's good. And uh, Manuel is asking if you have taste fine Robusta. <laughs> Um, not really. I mean, I've had Robustas that were, you know, considered 80 points and that was fine, but it wasn't, I've never had a Robusta that I'd want to drink. No, not personally. Okay. That, that's, that, yeah. I haven't had much experience with Robusta myself, so that's, that's, that's a good, but, um, and here we go with, uh, Meng Pedro, what would be your advice for someone just started roasting coffee? Well, assuming that he already has his own machine, I'm guessing, um, you know, do a lot of reading, read my books, read stuff online, but be careful where, you know, be careful not to believe everything you read online too much. Um, the most important drill is to roast your coffee, look at your curve in Cropster or Artisan, cup the coffee and always cup, don't do it by V60 or something, I do cupping, and then compare the shape of the roast curve, not the numbers, but the shape of the roast curve to what you taste in the cup and do that over and over and over. Like make a few changes to the gas settings, come back, get a new curve shape, cup it, look at the cupping and the curve back and forth, go back, roast it again. It's like a layup drill. You just, you just constantly compare the shape of the curve to what you taste in the cup and do that 10,000 times, 20,000 times, and then you'll make a lot of progress. And, and while we're on that, because it was one of my questions uh, anyway, because, uh, you, know, you know, with this question is similar to my question in terms of getting started with coffee, you know, and you're like, look, just go out there and learn. Mm -hmm. And, you know, don't worry about how much you get paid. With roasting, it's very difficult or challenging to reach employment because, you know, it's yeah. difficult to find employment compared to a barista job. Um, what are your thoughts about roasting at home and how good do you think the machinery available is at the moment? Because I've seen a lot of influencers and different people out there with their little roaster at home roasting what 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 do you think about that out of, out of curiosity i mean the little machines can do a great job little machines like the bella taiwan like um uh why, why am i forgetting the name of the company there's, there's a company in melbourne that has a handful of those um and little machines like the cormorant and all that like they do just as good of a job as a probot um so you can definitely roast pretty nice coffee at home with 500 gram machine um I think one way to get good at roasting is just to get the tiny machine. Like I did this with one of my business partners. I said, before we start the business, I want you to roast a thousand batches at home with the 500 gram machine. And he did 100 grams at a time. And for, so over the course of one year, he did a thousand batches, 100 grams at a time. And he got really good. And you know, cause you learn per batch, you don't learn per kilo. Yeah, that's, wow. That was commitment, a thousand batch on the little one. But that's, you know, that's what it takes, you know? Well, I suppose he drank a lot of coffee that year. Um, yeah. <laughs> and probably a lot of not good coffee too, because he probably didn't. Um, I'm sure he stuffed up some of the batches. Um, uh, so we got a few more here and the older ones. But Amir is asking, what's the difference between a gem dripper and V60 when you want to brew them? I honestly have no idea what the gem dripper is. I'm very sorry. Yeah, neither I am from taste and flavor. So, or maybe gem dripper maybe like a clever dripper is it is that what it is maybe it's a spelling mistake that's the only thing i can think about in comparison but um we can move on to the next question until we rephrase that okay. um and we go gerg no roger zapata skin if you have uh tried the tonino color meter id and if so what are your thoughts yeah, the Tonino, it, it measures the color of roasted and ground coffee, uh, like whole bean and ground. And um, it does a really good job. It's a very affordable, efficient little machine. Um, 
that said, generally, I'd rather not answer questions about products because uh, it kind of gets me in trouble. But yeah, hundred uh, percent. Tonino is a good little machine for sure. And we got an answer on the Jam Dripper. Uh, it is people have come to the rescue. Is by Stefanos, and I think uh, it's like a straight side V60 or something from Greece. Huh. So I believe that. Okay, a new product to try. There you go. Okay. <laughs> We're learning something here. Um, cool. Um, now, going back on, 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 the, on the questions, uh, I would love to pick your brain. Uh, where do you see the area with most room for improvement in the Australia market? In the Australian market? Oh, boy. Um, I mean, Australia has probably got the best market in the world as far as consistent quality. So there's not a lot of room for improvements. I think that um, it would be great to see Australia adopt filter coffee and do it better. Um, there's a lot of shops trying to push filter coffee, but they're letting it sit around for two or three hours or they're brewing too much at one time. And that's not very good. I mean, that's, you know, one of the reasons Australia is great is that they make really good espresso drinks and are always fresh. So they got to find a way to have the same kind of standard for filter coffee that they have for espresso. Um, but I know it's hard because customers aren't really into filter coffee yet. Yeah. And I think... I mean, without naming products, but most shops use a particular brand and usually, uh, how can I say it in a nice way? Well, it's not really a commercial machine, the machine you're thinking. Correct. About. Exactly. That's, that, that's where I was going. Uh, but what I found is there's a shop, particular shop and what they're doing, and I would love to know your thoughts about it because I, I think it's a decent idea. But what they do, they do, they do actually a big batch of manual V60 and they keep it in a thermos, a high quality thermos, and then they serve it. And the end product is cleaner than obviously, uh, like, you know, like a, like a you know, standard batch for non-commercial machinery. Uh, obviously the disadvantage is the manual labor, but yeah. you know, the consumer at the end pay the same as a standard batch brew. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a little sketchy because I don't think you can make a great fifth V60 over something like 25 grams. So I think they're they're compromising quality a little bit. Um, you know, with the with the decent espresso machine, in about six months, you'll be able to make a batch brew more or less. So, um, you know, I think that machines like that will come around so that you don't have to do two liters at a time. You can do one liter at a time or something like that. Um, because the Mocha Master is your one option right now to do one liter at a time, but it's not yeah. really a commercial machine. It's not a bad machine. It's just not made for cafe use. That's for home. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. And and I think I think when it comes down to that, a lot a lot of it is like you know, like you said, it's also temperature. You know how you know how cold it's going to sit there for two hours because there's not enough volume in in, in, yeah. in the shops. Even my customers, well, my former customers, because I'm now no longer work there, but. You know, sometimes we'll hop in the shop and I'm like, oh, what you got on today? I got this single, amazing. It was like, you know, 2 p.m. And I pull myself some and uh, it's that lukewarm. And it's just, yeah. you know what it tastes like. I don't need to, <laughs> need to tell you. Oh, yeah. Too well, too well. <laughs> you know what it tastes like. Um, oh, Ben is just joined through. Uh, hey, Ben from Teen Man Coffee Roasters. Next time you're in Melbourne, you got to see these guys out. Okay. Yeah, I love this guy. Um and he asked, what made you want to write and publish books? That's a great question. Yeah. So, you know, when I sold my first business, I, I always wished that there were books for me to read to make myself uh, better at coffee. And, and there really weren't any. I mean, there was David Schomer's book, but there was nothing else. And I, I decided, you know, I don't know if I'm ready to write this book, but I'll do some experiments. I'll do some research and I'm going to try and I just wrote the book more or less like a service to the industry, thinking that it would be a conversation starter that would help people talk about professional level coffee making. And I was really honestly quite surprised that the book sold pretty well. So, um, and it sold well enough that I wanted to write another book and another book, so, so it worked out okay. Um, but uh, really, I just, wished, I just wished there was a book like that. I wanted to read it myself, you know? Uh, that, that, that makes sense. And I think, yeah, knowledge, sharing knowledge is also very honorable. Because I think a lot of people tend to keep it all in, and I think sharing is actually quite good for sure. Yeah. Um, Ivy Cooley says, "I recently read your post about observations on hand pours. Have you found that cafes have adopted the use of more steep and release brewers?" No, I think that they're actually fading in popularity. 
I think that they're they're great for the home user who isn't very skilled, but they they don't extract as high as a V60 or a Kalita, and I think the result isn't quite as good because of that. Cool, thanks. And um, Hoofco is asking a question. I'm going to combine it with mine. Um, in relation to COVID, uh, how do you think this will impact producers? And I'll add to that, from producers all the way to cafes, all the way to consumer. You know, I I have to confess, I, I I don't know. I mean, I'm not a I'm not an expert in the coffee supply chain. I don't buy much green coffee, so I'm not involved in in buying at Origin. Um, it seems that. You know, we're drinking the same amount of coffee as we were a year ago, but it seems that the supply chain is kind of broken. So I think a lot of producers are quite worried because their normal supply chain isn't working and their coffee is aging. Um, that said, you know, I mean, everyone's adapting. I, I think, you know, in America, cafes are just doing a lot of takeaway and they're selling a lot more home brewing gear. Um, people like you and me are spending more time online doing doing online seminars and talks and things like that. But um, I I don't know I don't I don't claim to be an expert in, in how COVID is shaping the coffee industry. Yeah, th thanks for that. I think in the past twenty one episodes we covered, of course, this question several times. Uh, uh, I think ultimately it comes down to any business with any emergency. Uh, a key word is all about innovation and re-engineering. So, uh, you know, that doesn't, you know, mean that I'm an expert, but I think it's time to innovate and there's a lot of things that you can do with There's a lot of tools out there. And look, look at us as just, you know, humans. I, I've made more video calls in my life in the past, two, you know, uh, two months than ever before, but I could have done them a year ago, you know, so, and here I am doing it just now because of the virus. But yeah. Um, hopefully everyone is safe and farms and they you know, impact as bigger cities. Um, Steve Berko is asking, how can you tell whether hollow or generally poor tasting coffee is a result of how you brewed it, uh, the, eye, the extraction, whether it's the roast or whether it's the green? Okay, so the easiest, to know whether it, the easiest way to know whether it's the brew or the roast would be to cup it because you really can't screw up cupping. So, for instance, if coffee is astringent, you don't know whether it was channeling in the brewing or whether it was under development in the roasting or whether it was underripe cherry. But if you cup it and the astringency goes away, that means that the problem was in the V60 or the percolation that you did before. Right. As far as roast versus green, that's that's very difficult. You, you really have to practice looking at roast curves and, and evaluating them and understanding how they taste. I would say, you know, it becomes very easy to tell whether a coffee crashed or not. And it's very easy to tell whether a coffee flicked or not, but development levels and the more subtle flavors in coffee are very difficult to know whether it was roast or green because they're, they're never separate. They're always, the Venn diagrams are always inter intersecting, you know? Yeah. Uh, that, that answer. Thanks for that, Scott. And uh, we go, I think there was Danny here. Oh, here it is. Danny is asking, would you say that natural or anaerobic uh, fermented coffee with longer drying phase needs less time in the roasting compared to a washed coffee? You know, I hear things like that, but I don't have this experience. I, I don't, I think people are using too much energy going into first crack with naturals. And I think it's shaping their perception of the times needed to do certain things and such. But I don't, I don't think if you looked at my own roast, you would never know whether I was roasting naturals, washed or honeys or whatever. Um, I don't treat them any differently. I just, I just give them the right amount of gas for what they're asking for and keep their curve smooth. Cool. Thanks. And we got, Damn, username is a hard sometimes. Uh, U-T-K-U-O-Z-K, that's hard. Um, agitating coffee bed with Kalita, don't have much good result. Long brew time and needs coarser brew. What Scott Ralph thinks about that? Okay, so what I think you should do is, after you pre-wet, take the, take the Kalita and just give it a little bit of a spin, right? Then maybe you do one more pour, maybe two more pours, maybe three more pours, whatever you're doing. Wait until the end of the last pour and then only one gentle spin, like one half of a second. And what I see is I see people doing this and, and that drives fines to the filter and it clogs the filter. 
But if you just take it and give it just that little half a second spin, that'll be it'll be enough to break up channels and to to get rid of the channeling, but it won't clog the filter as much. So you should have a lot more flow. Cool. Thanks. And uh, Amir is asking if you're currently writing any new books. Well, I have a new roasting book that's coming out this week. So that's brand new. Hi. And I am working on another book as well. Yes. Okay. And uh, the other book is still about coffee? It's about coffee. Yes. <laughs> 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 That's good. Um, Barista Amir or Amir asking, how much coffee color difference should be before grinding and after grinding? I don't really understand the question. Yeah, uh, that's the first time I've, I've read that. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Or, I mean, usually color is difference between <laughs> green and roasted, but that's... Mm -hmm. um, Okay, now we have, we can move on to next. Uh, uh, there's a lot here. Oh, here we go. Oh, this is a great question, Camilo. I like this. Um, we got... Ah, oh, Camilo. Hey. <laughs> when you... <laughs> uh, where is it? Cause, all right. When you make coffee for yourself, are you ever satisfied? <laughs> Never, 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 never. It's terrible. Maybe, maybe like 10 times a year, I'm really happy with the coffee. <laughs> and would you say those 10 times, I'll try to be sneaky here, but would you say that 10 times are influenced by who and where and how you're drinking as well? No, not, not much, honestly. I really, feel like, I really feel like it's just that once in a while the cup is just magical, but it doesn't happen very often. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, yeah. Now, um, it's romantic, Mirko. I get it. Now, that's why I was cheeking in, because I knew, I knew the answer already. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, no, I got that feeling brain, too. So, I mean, I got the feeling brain, so you know, yeah. sometimes my coffee tastes better in company, but I know it doesn't. In reality. I, I, I do understand, I do. <laughs> um, big question, what would you like to see in the future of coffee? Uh, I just, I want to see more software, more data, more technology helping us do a better job. Cool. Um, I'm not scared of technology. I'm not worried about people being replaced by it. I mean, we, we adapt all the time in history. Um, you know, the things that the decent espresso machine has done for coffee, I want to see that happen with roasting and with grinding. And, you know, it's like the more data we have, the more we learn. Yeah. And we tend to demonize technology, but here we are, all of us on an iPhone, Google Pixel, Samsung, whatever you use. And it's like, up until 10 years ago, this would not be possible. And now a lot of people enjoy this session. So, yeah, I, I agree with, the, with that. Um, how does Scott suggest handling airflow when it comes to light roasts? So I don't, differ I don't differentiate between light roast and dark roast when it comes to airflow. I see okay. airflow as what I call machine management, right? Like it's, it's not about whether you're roasting Kenya or Colombia. It's about giving the right amount of airflow for your machine and your batch size so that you're exhausting the smoke and the chaff and you're providing enough airflow for convection. Um, I think people play with their airflow too much. Most of the time on most machines, you don't need to change the airflow during a batch. Um, if you're using too much coffee or your machine is not powerful enough, you may want to use low airflow to begin and then in the middle of the roast, raise your airflow. But I don't think people should ever be raising airflow at the end of the roast or anywhere near first crack. Um, people, once, once you do that, it's like you're taking a huge risk that you shift your curve a lot. So um, keeping it simple with airflow makes a lot of sense to me. Thanks, Scott. And uh, I think reconnecting to those 10 good cups of coffee, uh, D-Train is asking, are any of those magical moments naturals? <laughs> One. One. <laughs> One out of 10. <laughs> it, was, it was like a $300 a kilo natural. Yeah, it was amazing. Fair enough. Um, and we got Noaya Moore. Sindolor, have you ever cupped coffee from Cuba before? I have not. Neither I have. And where are we? There's a you know, lot we're, we're not. We're not allowed to um, trade with Cuba in America, as you know. 
Yeah, I suppose that you traveled a lot, but maybe you, you actually been there or not. But yeah, obviously not. Which is which is yeah. I never had Cuban coffee actually. And we got. What are you drinking? I'm just That's drinking some tea. tea. No coffee. It's, nice. Uh, it's five five in the uh, evening here, so no coffee. Okay. Okay. Um, so that's your cutoff time? Uh, usually about 1 p.m. I can't have caffeine after 1 p.m. or else I won't sleep very well. But obviously you had a lot before 1 p.m. Not just uh, not like a lot. Not a lot. Okay. I, I, drink, I drink one cup in the morning, sometimes maybe one and a half cups, but I, I keep it pretty tame unless I have to do a job. Okay. Makes sense. You conserve yourself for the... Yeah. For the, makes sense. I get you. Um, Scott, are you thinking to release your own roaster brand machine? If so, sampling or a six kilo roaster machine and which name would you give it to it? <laughs> I know what he, what he wants me to say is Ray Oster, but, um, no, uh, I've, I've, I would love the idea of building a machine, but I, I'm not good at manufacturing. I'm, I'm not, I'm not interested in a new career doing that. So, so no, I'm not going to build my own roasting machine anytime soon. No. Okay. Uh, Maestre Cafero, um, he's launching his new book next week. I can answer that because we covered it. Um, going back on the color question, Barista Mary is specifying. I mean, in order to perfectly roast coffee, how much difference the color of coffee should be before grinding and after grinding inside and outside? It's hard to answer. It honestly is. Yeah. It's, it, yeah. yeah I sorry. think sometimes, I think sometimes when it comes to, I know you like science and, you know, we, we all love you for that. Uh, Cause I'm, I'm far away from that kind of, you know, like even understanding. So you make it very easy for lots of us. I think sometimes uh, if it tastes good, it tastes good. Like, yeah. <laughs> like, I was like it, when I read some questions, I'm like, look, if it's tasting good, it's good. But if it's not tasting good, it's probably something, yeah. you know, uh, from A to Z that's gone wrong or multiple things. Um, I oh, I feel like some. There's strange. a lot of people who want everything to have an answer, but at the end of the day, there's, we don't have an answer to everything. And sometimes you just have to say, and, um, you know, I don't know what the color should be or anything like that, you know. Yeah, and we go back on technology and hopefully to see more uh, coming through as well to answer more yeah. questions, for sure. Yeah. And, uh, oops, I think I flipped my camera. All right, here we go. And we have, Phil has sent this through a couple of times, so I'll read it now. Does roasting need its own decent thing or recent technology is doing it right? Um, it's getting there. I mean, machines like the Stronghold are trying to do something similar to what Decent is doing with integration of software and hardware. Um, but yeah, roasting definitely needs something like the Decent Espresso machine. And, and I would love to see that happen. Absolutely. Cool. And we got a question from Andrew. Did you help Matt, Matt, Matt Berger with his home roaster? Oh, um, no, I mean, Matt and I talk all the time, but, uh, but he worked on it without me, yeah. Cool. And uh, Denny's asking, what would you like to see for the next generation roasting machine? Oh, just that. Just I want to see more software, more data, more precise control. I mean, my, my particular wish list I'll keep to myself because, you know, I, I do talk to companies sometimes about uh, using my services to get some new ideas. Cool. And uh, Dean Webo is saying, hey, I'm from Dean Webo Coffee in Puerto Rico. I bought the Scott, the Scott Roast course. It's great. <laughs> very interesting. <laughs> Thank you. Thank so you very much. much. Shout out. Um, <laughs> I, like, I like to read those too, you know. And uh, we have Subterra Coffee asking, when roasting a new bean, how do you decide how light or dark you want to take it? You know, you, you never know. I mean, you never know until you try it. But I mostly, I drop most coffees somewhere between mid to late first crack. So I'm, I'm usually going by the cracks when I'm not familiar with the coffee. And I'm saying, okay, you know, I'm, I'm whatever it is. I'm 75% of the way through first crack. It's about time for me to drop this coffee. Um, that's about the best I could do with a brand new coffee. 
Sweet. Um, D Train is asking a question I think most people would love to ask. Uh, where is your new book going to be available? Uh, so, once you uh, release it? on my website, scottrayo.com. Um, yeah. Very straightforward. Cool. That's, that's easy. And uh, uh, all right. Alia Diwani, what is the ideal degrees from first crack to end roast <laughs> if the DT three minutes? Okay, so questions like that are, are impossible to answer for many reasons. And this is, this is a very difficult part of my job is that I have to keep explaining to people that, you know, it depends on things like your bean probe. It depends on things like your environmental temperature. It depends on how dark you're roasting. So it depends, it depends, it depends. Um, there, there is no solid answer to a question like that. I'm really sorry. And do you, do you find, because now, I've, you know, the question coming through, I need to kind of repace it down because I think it's bombarding you. But as much as you like problem solving, uh, does it, like, how many people reach out to you every single day? Like, for oh, real? man, a lot. <laughs> for real. Yeah. Real talk here. Like, you know, like, I reach out to you and I probably, you know, got the draw lock that <laughs> you read it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I felt very lucky when you saw that. It's like, it'll email me for, for, you know, we'll arrange. But, you know, because you're out there and, you, you know, definitely people, you know, when I told my coffee friends, yo, like, you know, join me tomorrow morning, what now? It's like, oh, wow, it's going around. So it's like, it does it get overwhelming but at the same time you can't um, it's, it's 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 freaky it takes time that's all you know um i mean i get about 100 questions a week from random people i don't know and you know to answer the questions properly especially a question like that one takes a long time um yeah. so it's you know it can be frustrating it can be fun it can be difficult it can be you know a lot of different things you know and then and, and obviously there's there's some questions cannot be answered unless you actually hands on yeah. in place there and then doing yeah. whatever it's required yeah. to do. There's another compliment popping through from Brett. Your beginner course is awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, Brett. And, uh, and then we go to. Uh, okay, Scott from, again from. Mr. Zapata, how do you translate a sample roast down in Ikawa to a 12 kilo roaster? This is really important to understand that it's absolutely not possible um, for two reasons. One is that the, the convection of the Ikawa is a little different than the convection slash conduction of a 12 kilo drum roaster. And the other thing is that the Ikawa's bean probe is not in the beans. It's reading the air temperature above the beans. So you actually are not looking at a bean ROR curve in an Ikawa. So you have no idea what the data means in an Ikawa compared to a drum roaster. Cool. Um, hello, Scott. Steven from Roaster. Ro roaster. Hang on. This is coffee roaster, here. Yeah, Roaster. Yep. yep. Yeah. Um, while I know you don't have an answer to everything, I do know you have an opinion about everything. Uh -huh. so. Uh, um, it's a good question from <laughs> from Hoove, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll probably put, put something on top of that. He's asking, uh, who is your favorite people to learn from about coffee? And uh, I'll add to that, who would you like to sit at a dinner table with? <laughs> um, when it comes to coffee, I've learned a lot from my friend Andy Schechter, who's actually not a uh, coffee professional, but he used to participate in a lot of the uh, online coffee forums. Um, these days, I learn a lot talking to Matt Perger. I learn a lot talking to my friend Jonathan Gagne, who if you're not familiar with him, he's an astrophysicist who's gotten into coffee. Um, he has a blog called Coffee Ad Astra. And okay. it's amazing. It's really amazing. In fact, I'm helping him. He wrote a book about physics and coffee, and I'm helping him edit the book. And um, he's really like the smartest person I've ever come across in my life. And uh, his interest in coffee is tremendous. And he's learned and taught people so much about coffee already just in the year and a half that he's been in the business. Just he's not really in the business. He's just like interested in, in coffee, you know. Cool. I think that's really cool. Um, now, before we answer more questions, just, you know, I want to ask this because usually it's towards the end. We've already been on nearly an hour and Instagram. It's brutal at cutting off the lives. So, um, <laughs> yes. We covered a lot of ground here, uh, and thank you. Feeling super grateful. Yeah, thank you. Um, 
what's next on Scott's planet? Aside from COVID and all, and aside the book, what's next on your on your horizon? Yeah, I don't know, man. Horizon. It's honestly, it's, it's very hard to think about the future right now. You know, mm. I just wanna just wanna survive and get through this period because I feel like all my plans were canceled and all my travels canceled and all the things that I thought I would do, I don't know when I'll do them. And so I don't know what the industry is going to look like in a year when this is over. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's a very, very hard time to plan or to think about the future, you know? And where are you, where are you planning to come to Melbourne? Like before this? Yeah. I mean, oh. I would, I would be there right now if it wasn't for COVID. Yeah. Cause, cause mice was just a couple of days ago. Yeah, exactly. So hopefully, the November one was still possible. So we'll, we'll fingers crossed, I'll be able to meet you in person there. Uh, I mean, this has been great, but um, all right, cool. Is there, is there anything before we go back on questions from uh, the viewers that you left off the table that you want to share in terms of, you know, anything that you want to tell people? Uh, not really. I don't, I don't really have an agenda. I'm happy to, you know, answer people's questions and see what's on people's minds, you know? Cool, cool, cool. I always like to ask that because just sometimes people live with things that they wanted to say. Uh, um, I, think, I think we've got about four minutes on Instagram before it cuts us off, right? Yeah, about three, probably. Okay. Um, so this is going to be a tricky one. Um, how Lewis likes coffee. He's a good guy. He made me laugh the other day. Lots of great humor, so I've read his. How much do you think roasters are roasting to their water? Do you think that is a good thing? I don't know. I think about this a lot, but I don't think they're... I mean, look, yes, they're roasting to their water in the sense that they have no choice. Um, how much that affects how they roast the coffee is a very good question without an answer. Um, I mean, would they roast much differently if they were in a place with different water? I don't know. I mean, do you think people in Melbourne are really roasting that differently than people in Sydney? Not really, but their water is really different. Very. So I don't, I don't, I think, yes, people are roasting to the water, but no, it's not actually affecting their roasting all that much. Yeah. Cause then, cause we had the same, well, we had the issues by having, uh, you know, working for a large coffee roaster, which were present in different States in Australia. And we had that exact issue, same single, same blank. Tastes so much more differently, even from suburbs to suburbs, not just Melbourne to Sydney. It was like you drive out 15 Ks and the water is different. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah that's yeah, 100%. But yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, look, we don't want to get cut off brutally. Um, so, thank you for joining me, joining us. It was such an honor and pleasure of feeling a whole lot of gratitude. Um, we we'll definitely, a lot of us look up to you. Uh, we love what you do. Keep doing it. And I really appreciate your time. I know that you're, you know, busy man. Uh, so this, this occasion, it's a good reminder for everyone. There's a lot of focus on positives because this would never happen without, you know, being in a lockdown. You probably would not have had this hour uh, available. So yeah. really thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, I really, I really hope to meet you uh, in person uh, uh, sometime soon. So that means that everything is good. Uh, it was my pleasure, and I'll definitely meet you in Melbourne, and we'll sit down and have a coffee. That'd be nice. That would, yeah, that would be dope, man. And uh, I actually was watching the other day uh, to get in the mood. I was watching the, the Chris backup vlog when you when you joined him on, on oh, that. Yeah. On that yeah. So, yeah, that's another cat. That, um, yeah, it's interesting. interesting. But, um, yeah, thank you again very much. And, uh, you know, I, I really wish you and your family to stay safe, and uh, hopefully everything will be good soon, and I'm sure it will. Awesome. All right, Mirko. Thank you so much. Take care. Thanks, Scott. Take it easy, my man. Um, wow, I'm uh, overwhelmed uh, by... There's a lot to take in. Um, just overwhelmed by gratitude. Uh, that's all I can say. I uh, looked up at Scott for many years. Uh, it was a great occasion for, for, for us to meet online. It was a great occasion to meet with, with you guys. Thank you for joining. Uh, thank you for all the questions. It was very difficult to keep track. Sorry if I didn't answer. We, we didn't read all of them, but uh, there were just too many coming through and some were way too uh, specific uh, to their own version. And um, But yeah, this is what it's all about. Uh, I didn't want to go about the hour because I know he's busy and I didn't want to be greedy and uh, that's why we're just 60 minutes. The timer started here, 20 seconds to go. 
again, thank you for tuning in, wherever you are. Uh, please be safe, and uh, I really hope that you enjoyed this. If you have, please share it, tell friends, like it, and uh, we'll see you on Monday with a new big guest.